Good evening, colleagues, students, um, friends, visitors. I'm Sarah Worthington, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the law faculty for the 2021 Cambridge Freshfields Annual Law Lecture. This is the seventh lecture in this series, sponsored by Freshfields, held in the law faculty, and organised by the Cambridge Private Law Centre. One of the centre's ambitions uh, is to facilitate more informed and lively debate about some of the fundamental and significant issues that we face. Those issues are debated in a lively fashion in any law school, and it's wonderful to be back in person doing that. Our last in-person event was over two years ago, and we have Zoomed in between, but being in person is so much better. But the difference between our debates within the university lecture halls or over the dinner table or in seminar rooms is that we don't have to decide what to do. We don't have to come up with the best answer or one that will settle the issues between individuals or one that will provide uh, for some manner that will work for the whole of society or the community that we're a part of and be better for all. So what we try to do in these lectures is to bring someone in who's got real experience at the coalface. And that's certainly true tonight. Our speaker tonight has been in various roles that have required her to make just such real determinations that have both individual and public impact. Dame Sarah Fork is a British High Court judge and a senior judicial commissioner. She studied law at Sydney Sussex in Cambridge Cambridge is always a good start for an exciting career. Uh, she was admitted to practice as a solicitor, working for Freshfields. She then specialised, she specialised in corporate tax, an area that probably then had very few women, and was soon made a partner. In that time, she worked on some very public cases, including the corporate restructure of EMI. But partners do more than law. And at Freshfield, Sarah had various managerial roles and was involved in graduate recruitment. She then, did the surprising thing, left Freshfields to work as a consultant while doing some part-time judging. She became a full-time High Court judge in 2018, sitting in the Chancery Division. And for the students here, you'd of course expect me to say that is the best division to be in. At the time of her appointment, she was the third of only three women to be appointed to the High Court direct from private practice. And no doubt in recognition of that, and shortly after her appointment to the High Court, she was appointed to the Judicial Appointments Commission as the High Court's representative, and she still holds that role. So it's a special treat to welcome Sarah Fork to deliver tonight's lecture, engagingly entitled Modern Judging. As promised in the invite, Sarah will speak about modern judging, her experience as a High Court judge, having followed this unconventional path to the High Court, the selection of judges, and some of the lessons learned from recent events. It's perhaps a nice touch tonight, on the seventh anniversary of our first lecture in this series, that we not only have a judge, we've had a few of those, uh, or a practitioner, we've had a few of those too, or a woman, we've had a few of those, but we've got someone who ticks all three boxes, uh, and it gives me a special um, pleasure to say this, someone who's also got such strong um, affiliations with Freshfields. But enough from me. Uh, Sarah's chosen as her topic, Modern Judging. She'll speak for about 50 minutes, and we'll have time for questions after that. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, good evening. I'm delighted to be here and also uh, delighted to be able to speak to you all in person. As Sarah said, my theme tonight is modern judging. I became a High Court judge three years ago by what would traditionally be regarded as an unconventional route. A year later, I became the High Court representative on the Judicial Appointments Commission. I'll refer to that as the JAC. That's the body that's responsible for selecting all the candidates for judicial office 
in England and Wales. So I'll be talking a bit about my career path, my experience as a judge, during which I might be able to dispel one or two myths, something about what the JAC looks for in selecting judges in the 21st century, and finally, something about the future for court hearings. So as Sarah says, the first part said, said the first part of my career was actually quite conventional. I studied here, but not in this lovely building. Uh, the uh, law faculty then was stuck by the, uh, uh, by the Senate House. Um, I was at Sydney Sussex, then as now, best known to some for being opposite a rather well-known supermarket. <laughs> Very useful. Um, I loved law as a subject. I had no doubt I wanted a legal career, and that I wanted to be a practising lawyer, applying law in practice. I always preferred the problem questions to those essays on legal theory. At the time, the choice of the solicitor's profession for me, rather than the bar, seemed quite straightforward. I preferred the idea of working with clients directly. There was no such thing as direct access to the bar for clients then. <coughs> And I wasn't particularly attracted by advocacy. I didn't want to give advice and not find out what happened. I liked dealing with people. At the time, financial considerations were also important because pupil barristers weren't paid. And the first few years as a barrister without financial support could be really tough. City firms also seemed modern and progressive, though to most of you what they were like then would just be unimaginable. Uh, when I started work, there was one computer in the firm which took up a, ho a whole room. <laughs> Urgent communications went by something called the Telex machine, which many of you may never have heard of. A lot has since changed. So I joined Freshfields back in 1984 as what was, used to be called an article clerk, now a trainee. I quickly found my way to the tax department. This is not because I love tax or counting up numbers as such. It doesn't involve counting up numbers, actually. Um, but uh, because I love the law. It's a practice area where you have to deal with difficult legal problems daily, with a very significant body of case law to consider, as well as what is now a vast amount of statute, all having to be applied to real-life problems and where you know that HMRC, then the Inland Revenue, is always going to be there to mark your homework. Tax doesn't exist independently of other legal principles either. To analyse the tax treatment of a transaction, you need to understand exactly how it works and the broader legal analysis. At Freshfields, the tax lawyers are always known for asking those really awkward questions. What are you really doing? What is this transaction? So doing tax work enabled me to consider and apply a wide range of legal principles regularly across a variety of practice areas, whether raising equity or debt financing, buying, selling or merging businesses or investing in property. I was involved in some fascinating transactions. It was very hard work, but also very interesting. I'm not only saying that because Freshfield sponsors the lecture. My first unconventional step was a relatively early decision to start a family. I was only three years qualified when I had my first child. Without exception, up to that point, the relatively few female lawyers who chose to stay in practice in the city had waited until they became partners before having children. So when I announced my pregnancy, a few jaws dropped through the floor. There was no generous maternity package like most firms now have. So something was cobbled together while I was, um, that involved a bit of homeworking so that I could earn some money while I was on maternity leave. I went back to work pretty quickly and I became a partner uh, in 1994. I had a period of flexible working from 2004 when I had school-aged children and I was a very early proponent of working from home, something we've all got rather used to. I retired from the partnership at Freshfields in 2013 for family reasons and because I felt a need to reassess 
what I wanted to do. I told people I had to get off that hamster wheel to have a look at it and to have a look at some other things. I remained at the firm as a part-time consultant. In 2015, encouraged by a retired Freshfields partner who became a tax tribunal judge, I applied to be a fee-paid judge in the tax tribunal and was appointed. Fee-paid means part-time, so sitting ad hoc when you are offered hearings that you can fit in, usually with a relatively low expected minimum number of sitting days. You will also hear, and I will use the expression deputy judge, it means the same thing. The tax tribunal, which I joined, hears most challenges to HMRC decisions. There are two tiers. The first tier, which generally makes the initial decisions on both fact and law, with appeals to the upper tribunal on points of law, and from there, for some appeals, to the court of appeal. I gained invaluable experience in the first tier tribunal, including dealing with witnesses, litigants in person, and fact-finding, as well as deciding some pretty difficult points of law. I also had good experience in the upper tribunal. This was important to me because I'd had no real prior experience of litigation at all. My practice at Freshfields had been pretty much entirely transactional. However, although there are some common principles, the tribunals are still different from the courts. For example, they have their own procedural rules, and the extent of the jurisdiction that they exercise is determined by particular statutory provisions. Being in the upper tribunal brought me into contact with some high court judges because Chancery Division high court judges also sit in the tax chamber of the upper tribunal. So for the first time, I started to recognise that a judicial career outside tax might just be a possibility. I'd never previously considered it, in retrospect, I should have done so much earlier. I initially made an ill-prepared failed attempt to apply to be a deputy, that's fee paid, part-time High Court judge. A year or so later, a competition was running for full-time upper tribunal tax judges. In the end, this turned out to be what led me to apply for the full-time High Court role. I was trying to decide whether to apply for the salaried upper tribunal role, and I received some reverse mentoring from a partner at Freshfields, whom I had mentored in the past. She recognised that I wasn't really very keen on the full-time upper tribunal role. She encouraged me to aim high. She told me to get on with it, basically, rather than to assume I couldn't do it. It was the nudge, well, actually kick, as well as the vote of confidence that I needed. I'd never previously seriously thought that it might really be something for me. So I've talked a bit about my career path to becoming a judge, and I'm now going to talk a bit about my experience as a judge. My first key message is preparation. 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 Long gone, if it ever really existed, are, are the days of turning up in court considering arguments for the first time and then pronouncing. I usually use the analogy of an iceberg, the one-tenth of an iceberg that you see above the surface can be compared to the time in court, and the amount below the surface, nine-tenths, can be compared to the work out of it in terms of preparation but also judgment writing and other paperwork. That can be a bit of an exaggeration, but it often feels not very far off in the area I work in. So whilst court hours are typically 10.30 to 4.30, judges rely heavily on the time before and after court, as well as the lunch break, and days when they're not sitting in court. That includes those apparently long court vacations. Pre-reading is extremely important. Advocates are generally required to provide estimates of the time that you need for pre-reading. One thing you very soon learn is that those estimates are generally a fraction of what you really need to prepare properly. You'll often, but not always, form some provisional views, but obviously you've got to keep an open mind. That's essential. Oral submissions 
can certainly persuade you that any provisional view that you might have formed is wrong. The case can take a different or unexpected turn. You may properly understand or appreciate the significance of the arguments or the evidence for the first time. I'd also stress the importance of challenging your own views. You may well also need to consider different ways of approaching or solving a problem. The right answer might not be at either of the extreme ends of the spectrum occupied by the parties. There are particular challenges with litigants in person, that's parties without legal representation. You need to do further preparation because you've got to try to discern the relevant points, both factual and legal, from what might be a rather confused picture. Judges work very hard to try to ensure that litigants in person are not disadvantaged and that they are helped to identify what areas they need to focus on, which are often rather different to the points that they think are the most important ones to make. Judges expect advocates for any representative party to assist, particularly in identifying relevant legal points. But it's also really important to make sure that litigants in person feel that they've had their opportunity to be heard, literally their day in court. That said, the normal procedural rules do apply to litigants in person. We can't just take a lax approach, for example, to time limits, because they're not represented. That would be unfair to other participants in the legal system. Another example where you may have to work hard to identify issues or concerns is with ex parte applications for urgent relief. This is where a litigant comes to court without giving notice to the other side, seeking urgent relief. For example, an injunction freezing bank accounts or other assets of someone who's alleged to be dissipating assets with a view to ensuring that a future judgment against them could not be met, it's generally called a freezing injunction. In those cases, what might uh, appear as significant urgency in a black and white case uh, needs to be interrogated carefully. You have to stand back, challenge whether there's been full disclosure, whether the true picture's in fact rather different to the one that you were presented with, and whether the applicant really does need the protection they're seeking. Paperwork. I've already mentioned paperwork, though it's rarely now in physical form, it comes on screen. Applications on paper, meaning applications determined without a hearing, are a significant proportion of a judge's work. They can be substantial issues at stake. For example, applications for permission to appeal are generally decided on the papers, at least initially. Or there may be matters where parties are content for the issues to be, term, to be determined without a hearing. But that can cover substantive matters. For example, I recently granted something called a website blocking order. Uh, that's an injunction granted against internet service providers, requiring them to block some of those sites that you may or may not have seen, which stream films and TV programmes without a licence and in breach of copyright. In that case, the parties were content for me to deal with it on the paper, but I issued a detailed judgment. I think I've made it sound like hard work. It is, and my family will attest to that, but it is also immensely interesting, and it's very varied. As Sarah set, said, I sit in the Chancery Division of the High Court. That division is part of, group, of a group of courts called the Business and Property Courts, which includes two courts, that form part of the Queen's Bench Division. That's the Commercial Court and the Technology and Construction Court. And there's an enormous variety of work in the Chancery Division, ranging from complex business and financial markets disputes, which overlap with the Commercial Court, to insolvency and companies' work, intellectual property, competition, real property, and, of course, tax. We also deal with appeals from the County Courts, which increases the variety further. You might be dealing with a boundary dispute one day, or a small-scale bankruptcy, as well as higher-value matters. When I was invited to join the Chancery Division, I, I realised with a lot of trepidation 
that that division covers every single specialist area dealt with by my previous firm, Freshfields. That can appear daunting, but there can also be some benefits, if only in straightforwardly ensuring a lack of preconceptions. There are some common approaches to sort of problem solving that you can apply across different disciplines, and many principles are common to different areas of law. I'm much more of a convert than I was previously to, to the notion that able judges can sit in areas well outside their original specialist area. That doesn't mean that specialist knowledge is not important. It is, but judges are usually looking at a discrete issue or series of issues. You can also talk to specialist judges to check that your attention is being drawn to all the relevant issues, particularly if you have any doubt about whether that has occurred to the extent to which you want. That's one area where judicial antennae tend to develop fairly quickly. So overall, the variety is a good thing. It's certainly very interesting. You are never bored. You also have a really intense focus on the case in hand, so much so that judges develop a form of tunnel vision and they can't remember what they did last week or sometimes even yesterday. That point I've just made is, is a bit less of an issue with long cases, long trials. They may last for weeks or months. That raises major challenges for participants, but certainly for the judge in making the process manageable. The trial timetable is important, and the judge's views on that may differ from those <coughs> of the parties. This arises most often in relation to the time needed to cross-examine witnesses. The parties will tend to come to court with a deep knowledge of a case that they have lived and breathed, perhaps for years. Their focus will be on how witnesses perform in the witness box, and in particular, how witnesses for their opponent will stand up to cross-examination. Judges' perspective is often very different. In most cases, certainly in the business and property courts, the most significant evidence is usually contemporaneous documentary evidence. And the judge wants to be taken through that in a sensible fashion, often chronologically, and not necessarily as part of a point scoring exercise. This and other points are reflected in a new practice direction, grand title of PD 57 AC, that was introduced in April and applies to trial witness statements. That means uh, witness statements for final hearings in the business courts. Just a bit of background for anyone not familiar with civil litigation. Unlike criminal cases, in general, in civil cases, evidence in chief is given by a witness statement which the judge pre-reads, with oral evidence mainly being taken up with cross-examination by opposing counsel. Whilst the underlying principles in the new practice direction are not new, it provides a very clear statement of them with some sanctions for non-compliance. In particular, it says in terms that the aim of a witness statement is to record matters of fact within the personal knowledge of the witness and that its function is not to argue the case or to take the court through documents. Both of those are a matter for argument by the advocate. The new practice direction includes a statement of best practice that records some points that are really well known to judges, in particular by making it clear that many matters of fact don't need witness evidence, there may, may be no dispute about them, or the witness may add nothing to the documents. But it also makes express reference to the fallibility of memory. Memory isn't a simple mental record of an event which fades over time. It's fluid and malleable. It's therefore vulnerable to being altered by a range of influences without the individual necessarily being conscious of the alteration. In that connection, it's interesting that the new practice direction recommends that witness statements go through as few drafts as possible, since repeat revisiting can itself corrupt recollection. Over time, this new practice direction ought to lead to a shift in approach where, in broad terms, 
longer is spent taking the judge through documents in the advocate's opening submissions, and pre-reading is made more focused. For example, in relation to one long planned uh, trial, I recently made directions for the parties to identify well in advance of the trial the core documents on which they intended to rely, and if possible, to agree composite narratives explaining what each party said were the relevance of those documents, together with a chronology. The idea would be that when pre-reading, the judge can look at the narratives, the key documents, and the chronologies. Witness statements should then be shorter because they'll be confined to their proper scope, and opening submissions can be based around the narratives. So the topic of long trials lead me on to the subject of judgment writing. Judges have to get those essays out, and we all have different techniques. You also need to work fast. The general principle is that judgments should be produced within three, within three months of the end of a hearing, even for a substantial trial. That can be a real challenge at times. Everyone has their own techniques. Mine include taking detailed notes during the hearing. I do that on a laptop rather than an old-fashioned book, so my notes are searchable. I uh, personally also write up my impressions of witnesses the same day or very shortly after the hearing, hearing their evidence. That's important. You may be hearing from dozens of witnesses. And you, I may even start on individual building blocks of a judgment. For example, thinking about the relevant case law and how it might apply, or working on discrete parts. I've used the uh, analogy of a jigsaw. You know those really frustrating jigsaws where you manage, you, you're able to do the outside. You may manage a few of the characters or features in the middle, and then you're left with this enormous amount of grey sky. Judges have to finish the grey sky. And we get there in the end. So doing some work on at least part uh, of the judgment or towards the judgment as you go along can help focus on the issues that you are finding most difficult. And that, in turn, can enable you to ask the questions you really want to ask the advocates before the end of the trial. At the other end of the scale from those uh, long trials and judgments is extemporary judgments. What that means is oral judgments given at the end of a hearing. This is a big change for me from the tax tribunal where oral judgments are virtually never given. And it did seem daunting to me. But it is important to give extemporary judgments where possible to ensure that cases are dealt with efficiently and that the workload is manageable. It does require certainty of decision and enough preparation to be able to set out the key facts and the reasoning at least reasonably coherently. For anything complex, you may need to take a bit of time to put your thoughts in order. But if you are in doubt, you will need to reserve judgment and provide it in writing at a later date. I also want to say a little bit about active case management. There's a significant focus on the efficient conduct of litigation. Judges are really acutely aware of the cost of litigation and the need to ensure that court resources are fairly and appropriately allocated. Judges often intervene proactively to try to ensure efficient case management might be such things as joining cases together, determining the order in which they're heard, or adjourning to allow the parties to attempt to reach agreement. But further steps are being taken to embed opportunities to resolve disputes outside the courtroom, particularly by mediation. For example, there's a new scheme involving a default recommendation of mediation for appeals from the county court to the high court. There are also much more ambitious plans to shift far more processes online and do so in a way that makes dispute resolution not only more accessible and more efficient, but also embedding more opportunities for consensual resolution. That can only be a good thing. Parties engaged in litigation can become increasingly convinced 
of the merits of their own case, each time it is repeated and elaborated, making settlement much harder. Before I leave the topic of my experience as a judge, I want to dispel one myth. People often ask, it's a lonely job, isn't it? No, it isn't in my experience. There's a strong camaraderie between judges, we have shared experiences, and we spend a lot of time discussing legal as well as practical issues. We provide each other with support. In some areas, we also don't sit alone, for example, in the Competition uh, Appeal Tribunal, the Tax Tribunal, or indeed the Court of Appeal. But ultimately, the decision that you make on a particular case is your responsibility. So what were the differences for me with my background? Well, I had a very, very steep learning curve when I joined the High Court in 2018. I hadn't opened what's called the White Book, the Procedural Rules Bible, before, before uh, a few months before I joined. One theme I will revert to is thinking about the possibility of a judicial career earlier than I did and getting more experience in court earlier, whether it's as a tribunal judge, a deputy district judge, a recorder or a deputy high court judge. Training and that experience will not only make the transition easier, but will bring you into contact with other judges, including contemporaries with whom you can share experiences. This leads me on to my next topic, judicial selection. Excuse me. I'm in my third year as the High Court representative on the Judicial Appointments Commission, the JAC. The JAC is a statutory body that is responsible for running selection exercises and making recommendations for judicial posts in England and Wales, up to and including the High Court. It also has some involvement in more senior appointments. As a commissioner, I take part in the JAC's strategic decision-making and all its decisions on recommendations for judicial office. I also sit on the appointment panel for the annual High Court competition, which was a bit odd the first time because I'd only been on the other side of the desk uh, a couple of years earlier. So that, that role involves reviewing all the applications for the High Court in detail and conducting selection days with other panel members. Uh, selection days usually comprise interviews and some form of practical test. For some, role, for some judicial roles, it might be a role play with actors or a fictional scenario or fictional scenarios raising problems of the kind you could come up against in practice. The volume of judicial recruitment is high and it's likely to remain high over the next few years. For example, the programme that the JC is being asked to deliver this year involves approximately 1,100 recommendations to judicial office. The JC has a statutory duty to select candidates on merit who are of good character. It also has a statutory duty to attract diverse applicants. This is on the basis that the judiciary should reflect the diverse society that it serves. Where relevant, the JAC applies what's called an equal merit provision, EMP, both at the shortlisting stage and at the final decision-making stages. Under the EMP, where candidates are judged to be of equal merit, the JAC can give priority to candidates from underrepresented, underrepresented groups. Those are determined by reference to ethnicity and gender. In addition, the JAC has recently moved to name-blind shortlisting. JAC is also heavily involved in outreach work because we want to ensure that the pool of applicants for individual competitions is as strong as possible and extends to groups that are underrepresented in the judiciary. That includes solicitors as well as those with disabilities uh, in addition to BAME and women. Whilst progress has been made, there is much work still to be done, particularly in the senior judiciary. So what are the barriers to judicial appointment? 
The picture on judicial diversity is complex, and the JC alone doesn't hold all the levers to affect change. In particular, it depends on pools of applicants being available from the professions, typically at a relatively senior level. Unlike some jurisdictions, we don't have a career judiciary, and candidates tend to apply only once they are well established in practice. If there is limited diversity amongst senior barristers and solicitors, then that has an impact on diversity, particularly in the senior judiciary. To help start addressing that, the JEC now chairs the Judicial Diversity Forum, which aims to bring together organisations from across the legal sector to support increased judicial diversity and provide strategic direction for initiatives. Specifically for solicitors, and in particular those like me who, who have not been regularly involved in litigation, I'd agree with research that indicates a lack, there's a lack of information uh, and understanding about what judicial roles involve uh, has contributed to um, a lack of applications from solicitors. But there is also more fundamentally uh, a lack of understanding about what is available. But importantly, there can be a perception for all minority groups of being an outsider. A well-established London-based barrister who's seen other barristers from their chambers become high court or senior circuit judges, not only has people that they may have known for a long time to talk to about their experience, to offer advice, perhaps even read their applications or provide a reference. But they also have judges that they can readily identify with. They've done it from a similar starting point, so can I. That can make a real difference to levels of confidence and dispel any concerns about a judicial culture to which a candidate may feel that he or she would not belong. One of the initiatives I'm most enthusiastic about is a targeted judicial outreach programme that started uh, a sep September a year ago, the aim of which is to engage directly with candidates from underrepresented groups, and in particular candidates aiming for senior salaried roles. Those participating in the programme, who include promising near-miss candidates from previous competitions, receive tailored advice and support, including support from a judicial guide. One of the aims is to improve confidence and overcome imposter syndrome. A large number of High Court judges have volunteered to act as judicial guides on this programme. An important theme that emerges is the value that can be obtained from different types of judicial experience as a preparation for more senior roles. For example, the Deputy High Court competition, which is a fee-paid role which is increasingly seen as the gateway to a full-time appointment to the High Court, is extremely competitive, but it's really not the only way to start getting judicial experience, as I hope I show. So what's the JEC looking for when it's selecting senior judges? There are three broad areas of skills and abilities. Legal and judicial skills, personal qualities, and leadership. You might think it's only the first of those, but it's all three. All of them are important. First, legal and judicial skills. This not only requires exceptional intellect uh, and the ability to uh, analyse complex issues and reach clearly reasoned decisions, but you also need to be able to master unfamiliar areas fast. The second category, personal qualities, covers a broad range of important skills, including not only the obvious requirements of integrity and independence, but also strong listening and communication skills. The third category, leadership, goes beyond pure leadership skills and includes being a team player, including with court staff, and supporting those staff. It's not necessarily the case that a good advocate will make a good judge. The JC looks for transferable skills. For example, when I applied, 
I use examples of challenging situations I'd had at work, both in my legal practice and management roles, but also experience outside work, in my case, as the chairman of a quite challenging charity. The JC will be looking to understand what the candidate's contribution was and how they dealt with the difficulties. Good examples can't be put together overnight, so applications require a lot of work and commitment. My final topic is about the conduct of hearings, particularly in the light of lessons learned from the pandemic. In March 2020, the business and property courts moved almost overnight to remote working. As a result, there have in fact been no major backlogs at high, uh, at high court level in those courts, although a number of trials were put off. Initially, judges were conducting hearings from their homes using emergency powers under coronavirus legislation. Everyone's obviously learnt an enormous amount about remote working in the last 18 months or so, and the courts are no exception. Here are some observations about the likely long-term impact of the lessons learned for the civil courts. First, we're never going to return to the same reliance on paper bundles, meaning what were typically multiple lever arch files creaking full of relevant documents and legal authorities. That switch is obviously better for the environment, but it's also ultimately much more efficient. Our greatest gripes now are usually in making sure that the PDFs are searchable, can be marked up electronically, and making sure we've got enough screens in court, as well as leads to connect them to your laptop. In the business and property courts, there's, there's also now a general consensus that short procedural hearings will usually continue to be suitable for remote hearing, at least when there are represented parties. But that as a general rule, longer hearings, especially those involving live issues and potentially uh, live evidence and potentially issues of credibility, will usually justify an in person hearing. But there are important caveats to this. First, many litigants in person might either find it difficult or too daunting to access the necessary technology, or they may otherwise be able to satisfy you that they're at a disadvantage in a remote hearing setting. Secondly, in more substantive hearings with witness evidence, some witnesses, especially those for whom significant travel would otherwise be required, may well continue to give evidence remotely. This will particularly be the case with expert witnesses, but it isn't limited to them. It's also been recognised that it is in fact possible to assess credibility remotely when you need to do so. The idea that this is done by reference to a person's physical demeanour, at least to any material extent, is generally regarded as outdated. Certainly in the business court, judges tend to place particular <coughs> emphasis on any contemporary documentary evidence before considering other factors, which will include inherent probabilities and motivations. Third point is that even procedural hearings can benefit tremendously from the sort of interaction between legal teams that is far easier with an in-person hearing. These interchanges can make a real difference in resolving misunderstandings, narrowing differences, and even re reaching a settlement. More generally and prosaically, it's also very easy to underestimate just how exhausting conducting or participating in a remote legal hearing can be. It tends to be significantly more tiring than an in-person hearing, and it requires more frequent breaks. So, whilst, uh, in addition to that, whilst remote hearings can be more efficient for the parties and their representatives, uh, you hear of barristers able to attend courts in different cities on the same day, just by pressing different buttons, and so they can take on more work, good for them. It also is the case that courts can generally get through fewer cases because it's in, it, there are increased difficulties in successfully listing and managing multiple short hearings on a remote basis. 
But there's also a recognition that it's important that judicial powers are exercised and seem to be exercised from court buildings, even if the parties or others attend remotely. There are a number of reasons for this. One is that it best helps meet the need to maintain the solemnity of the court, which is critical in ensuring respect for it and ultimately for the rule of law. There had been concerning indications that unrepresented, uh, unrepresented litigants, at least, were taking the court's process rather less seriously than they should because they were attending online, perhaps on their phone, rather than acting as if they would in a physical court. But there's also the fundamental point that justice must not only be done, but it has to be seen to be done. The critical importance of public justice is far too easy to underestimate. Whatever is done to enable the press and public to access remote hearings and a lot of steps have been taken. Issues of perception can remain, but the press or public just won't uh, be able to, or will not in fact, wander in and out of a hearing as easily as they did before. Or at least they won't have the same immediate appreciation that the work of the courts is continuing in public buildings. The fact that hearings are going on is simply not so obvious with remote hearings, even, the, even if details of the link to join it are published. We've all seen many examples of TV reporters or newspaper photographers outside court buildings. Remote hearings just don't have the same public impact. But we should also continue to see an increase in what's called hybrid hearings, that's where some participants are present in person, typically advocates, the judge, a limited number of additional members of the party's legal teams and any witness giving evidence in person, and with others seeing and hearing the proceedings through a dedicated link. In complex trials, this can be accompanied by electronic document presentation, where documents, relevant documents are displayed on screens and real-time trans transcription, where you can see the transcription as it's being produced. I have myself conducted three major trials on a hybrid basis since June last year. I think that is the way of things in the future, at least in the business courts. One thing that the use of electronic bundles and evidence by video link has done is it's had a real effect on the extent of the kit you need both for the judge and the other participants. Trials tend to look very different these days. If you walked into a big trial in the business courts now, you'd probably be more stuck, struck by banks of screens, heavy IT equipment and technical support teams rather than wigs and gowns. I have to usually allow people not to wear wigs and gowns because the heat of all the machinery is so great that I worry they'd faint. <laughs> Finally, I've, I've already touched on the uh, reform programme for the courts. One of the aims of that is to try to ensure that fewer disputes end up in court. <coughs> that doesn't mean there won't be any need for judges. Uh, the digital age has brought many changes, but I don't think anyone is predicting that judges will be redundant. However, the hope is that the reforms will, in time, allow judges to focus on cases that really warrant judicial decision-making because they raise difficult issues of fact and law that are genuinely not amenable to a negotiated settlement and that the judges spend less time on administrative tasks. In conclusion, I hope I've managed to give you some insight into my path to the judiciary, my experience as a judge, and what we look for in selecting judges, as well as something about the future direction of travel for court proceedings. I'd now be very happy to take any questions you have.
really was the last question. So uh, I, I know there are more, but one of the nice things about public lectures is you go uh, wanting a bit more discussion and you can have that outside the door. So we've got a um, formal thank you from uh, Diva Das, who's a partner at Freshfield. Right, I'll come on. You. Thank you. It's fun being on this side of the uh, lectern. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah Das. I'm a partner in the antitrust litigation practice at Freshfields, and it falls upon me to give the vote of thanks for this evening's event. Uh, obviously, first and foremost to Dame Sarah, a trailblazer at Freshfields, where she's still spoken of in hallowed terms, um, and now uh, on the bench and on the Judicial Appointments Commission, uh, a modern lawyer and a modern judge. Uh, also, as, er as ever, to, to Sarah Worthington, uh, for her usual efforts in corralling us uh, tonight and, uh, and for her efforts generally in uh, her stewardship of the Private Law Centre. Uh, as she mentioned, this is the eighth uh, Cambridge Freshfields lecture and Freshfields is pleased to continue to support uh, and be associated with the PLC in its pursuit of rigorous, informed and significant private law research and debate. <clears throat> I think the importance of cutting-edge scholarship in private law is uh, not lost upon me as a partner in, in an international law firm uh, where my last week has involved considering COVID disruption, Brexit, the regulation of big tech and economic nationalism. And it seems to me with that international perspective that uh, combining private law scholarship with modern judging is certainly where the UK's comparative legal advantage lies. Um, informed debate also needs informed people, and I'm pleased to see so many of you here in person um, post-COVID. It's great to see. Um, one thing that Freshfields also supports is Cambridge's access and widening participation programme. I think to pick up the thread from what you were talking about, about judicial diversity, I think it's important as a firm we support efforts to bring more people into Cambridge and into the legal profession and one day into judging. Um, I will stop there. Normally I'd say we should all go for a glass of warm white wine, but I think uh, COVID has put paid to that, but, uh, but maybe next year. I am but... sorry to the students, <coughs> I really am. But I'm sure they've got uh, other things to be getting on with. Um, so just to say a final round of applause for Dame Sarah. <laughs>